Tom Lehrer there with Bat's Mathematics, a uh, rarity that, that was included on the box set that they put out, I guess already more than 10 years ago. So the, the guest I have on the program now, Bob Claster, who is in the neighborhood with us, or at least by telephone, or, or no, I'll correct myself, in the neighborhood with me, since I am the one talking to him, and all of you out there, God bless you, are listening. So he got to talk to Tom Lehrer. Unfortunately, perhaps not his best interview, but I give you credit for posting it on your website to have your mistakes up there as well as your, you know, your shining well, I'm moments. Sure it's, it's not as egregious as I, as, you know, I'm, I'm fairly self-critical and hard on myself. And so, uh, you know, it probably is something that if I hadn't pointed out, a lot of people wouldn't have noticed, but I don't mind. I don't care. I have no shame. So who are some of the better uh, inter- interviews at, at the station? After Tom Lehrer, who else? Oh, well, I, he, 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 that's the only one that I think was, that, that I hear it and, 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 and think. I, was, I learned that lesson very quickly. Cool. Uh, uh, you know, I learned it from the first one. Uh, but right after that, I did uh, Jonathan and Darlene Edwards. Uh, one thing I need to correct, you said that, that, I did these, that I did these things live and in the studio. In most cases, oh. I was bringing portable recording equipment to wherever these people happen to be and and then I would edit them uh, for broadcast so uh, they they weren't live for the most part the John Cleese and Michael Palin uh, duo interview which is marvelous uh, it's pretty close to live because they were so good uh, and 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 I, in that one, I just sit back and say hello, and then shut up for half an hour, and then that's why it's the best one because they're just so great together. And I highly recommend to anybody who's going to listen to that one. You can hear these things at bobclaster dot com. Um, if you're going to listen to that one, try and listen to it in stereo, uh, preferably with headphones, because I I w- was smart enough to. Uh, pan them uh, in the stereo spectrum so because uh, there are a lot of moments where they're talking under each other and the funniest stuff is the stuff that like Palin says under his breath and Cleese is going on and on and sl- becoming slightly too pompous <laughs> which he has a tendency to, to do from time to time or the little comments that John makes under his breath when Michael is talking so um, uh that's a, that's a pretty good one. And so I, I just listened to it this week, and it really is quite delightful. And one of the weird, the cool things about it is, you know how on every late night talk show, on every show, the, the guests go on there and they talk about some movie that they're doing, and you know that the, they play a clip and they say, "I was it to work with this actor," and blah blah blah. And you hear Cleese from oh gosh, fifteen twenty years ago, and he's talking about this new movie that he's just been working on, and it's. A fish called Wanda, and it's kind of right. neat that this particular time it's like a minor comedy classic that he's talking sure. about, but not knowing at that point, just saying, "Oh, here's my new well, film." Jamie Lee, Lee Curtis is in it. Michael's in it. Blah blah blah. You know. So. The the first interview I did with John was at a hotel. That that uh, the one with Michael actually was down at the station, and I I was a big hero at the station for dragging those guys in sure. that day. Oh yeah. But. Uh, uh, the, the first time I met John was for uh, Clockwise, this film that he made, and, and he was being dragged around by Universal to promote that. And he liked the movie, and he thought it was okay, but he wasn't overly enthusiastic about it. And it's not a movie you can be all that overly enthusiastic yeah. about. It's kind of cute, and it's got some moments. But, you know, he was doing his duty and, and, and promoting the film. Um, I sat down with him, and I was like interview number 15 of the day. And my first question for him was something along the lines of, what is the difference between the Oxford and the Cambridge sense of humor? Ooh, nice. And his, and his eyes lit up, because Python was half Oxford and half Cambridge. Right, of And that, that, uh, that interplay uh, is crucial to understanding who they were and what they were about. Uh, and there is a very clearly defined sensibility for the two schools. It's, um, yeah. No, it's funny that you should, should bring that up because I was just thinking about this the other day. Of like how if you ask someone who might be reticent or bored or kind of like, oh, I've got to do this, but if you, you, you show that you're on a little bit more of their wavelength, it, right. it can make all the difference in the world. I'll, I'll tell this very quickly, but I remember meeting, um, not meeting, but seeing Lou Reed in the street. Some you know, a decade or two ago, and you know it's. Man, I share a birthday with. 
Oh, really? What, what, what's your birthday? March the 2nd. March the Well, happy in four months birthday to you and to Lou. Uh, I call him Lou, even though he'd probably hit me if I did. But, you know, you see... Name. Sorry? It's his name. It's his name. Well, yeah, I, or I, I call him Mr. He probably you called him Shirley. <laughs> well, not 30 years ago, but, but 20 years ago he might have. But Lou is, Lou is a lot closer than Shirley. It, it, yeah, quite a bit. Or, or what was the the girl character that he was playing in those those Transformer years? What was it? Was um, Ray, or his girlfriend was Rachel? But it was a man named Rachel. I have to go back and look up that whole era. But anyway, anyway. Uh, so I saw him and I was like, oh my god, it's Lou Reed. Do I just kind of gape and look the other way, or can I get his autograph? But this was like pre Laurie Anderson, probably. So it's like all his reputation was negative and stay the hell away and you know he'll just bite your head off so I but I you know me being me I'm like no I can't pass up this opportunity and I go up and you know, say hi Mr. Reed you know and, and rather than be like the 10 million people who would say oh man Walk on the Wild Side is so freaking awesome you know, or, or you know Sweet Jane man that was like oh I was like well I love all your work and I love Berlin and I hear that you're going to do more work on a project that he was doing with John Cale at the time called Songs for Drella. And, you know, because I was a fan, a real fan, and I was following his career. So I said, you know, are you going to do that at Brooklyn Academy of Music, or what's the deal with that? And again, he went from being this stone-faced, like, who is this a-hole talking to me on the street, to, oh, yeah, no, the, you know, John and I are still working on that, and we've got a project together. And, you know, thanks, man. And I got his autograph, and I got the hell away. <laughs> but asking the right question of the right person at the right time, it, make, it makes that difference like it did that first time you got to John Cleese on, the, on that day of saying Oxford versus Cambridge. Was He He was the Oxford, right? Yes. And no, no, Terry, no, no, no. Cleese, was, Cleese was Cambridge. T- uh, Cleese was Cambridge, and then so... We, the Oxford we, ones were Jones and um, uh, let's see, Terry Jones and Michael Palin both went to Oxford. Wow. And uh, I believe Terry Gilliam did as well. Cool. But I'm not sure about Terry Gilliam. He may he may be none of the above. But I if, if, I think because I think Terry Gilliam went to college in the United States for a while. So right, he, was, he was the American. So right. But, but let right. me ask but, you. But, but he sort of he sort of he's the honor. We'll give we'll make him the honorary Oxfordian. <laughs> and the Cambridge boys were were um, were Cleese and. Chapman and Idol, no. uh, but it, yeah. you have the same dynamic in Beyond the Fringe. You have two Oxford and two Cambridge. Now, speaking of Beyond the Fringe, it was John Cleese who really did you a, a solid a favor, or well, maybe you don't feel that way, of getting one of your most famous and, and unusual and reclusive guests for your radio. Oh well, no, he did me, he did me a wonderful favor, and he was a splendid fellow, and 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 you know. When I did that first interview with him, you know, the one that started with that Oxford and Cambridge question, uh, his eyes lit up and he said to the, the, the poor woman who was the, the publicity person for Universal who was trying to flog this picture, uh, you know, she, he said, to, you know, cancel the rest of my day. I'm gonna, <laughs> I think we're going to be here for a while. Oh, and, and, and when the interview was finished, he said that was one of the most remarkable interviews I've ever had. And please get a copy to me. So I gave him a copy. And then it started like this pen pal relationship. And we stayed in touch for a number of years. And so, uh, you know, he came to me to promote a fish called Wanda rather than me going after him at that point. Oh, lovely. And there's a whole long and ultimately very sad story about a TV documentary series that he wanted me to produce for the Pythons that I desperately wanted to do and tried to do and it broke my heart when it fell apart and then I ran into Michael Palin years later and he tried to resuscitate it because he liked the idea too and it looked like it was going to happen again and again it didn't and it breaks my heart that I never got to make that I don't understand I mean if it's Monty Python wouldn't there be the money to put together Yes, there was, there was the money to do it. The problem is the P- Python's, uh, uh, the, the way things work in Python is none of that money gets spent. No decisions are made on behalf of the group without a unanimous decision. Oh. And that's it's not that it's so hard to get them to agree on anything. It's just so hard to get them all together in the same place at the same time. 
and that was what held things up uh, for a long time. Plus, there was a woman uh, who was running their company. Terry Jones explained this to me many years later. He said, "He said, you know, there's this woman. Uh, I won't mention her name, but uh, there's this woman who runs things for us, and she's got a lovely life, and she's married to a barrister, and they have this great house out in the country, and her life is much more pleasant and much less complicated when we're not actually in production. So she does everything that she can to dissuade production." <laughs> Oh, and to man. keep it from happening, and he suge he suggested that she may have been the one to sink this. Uh, but it was going to be it was going to be a six part uh, uh, history of uh, that particular wave of British comedy, uh, based on a, a, a wonderful, wonderful book called From Fringe to Flying Circus. I believe the book is out of print, but it is well worth hunting for. I vaguely remember uh, reading it and, and liking it quite a lot. Yeah, It's an amazing book, and I had it with me when I did the Cleese and Palin interview, and that was sort of what led to this, uh, to this whole sad project, was I had the book with me, and both Michael and John said, glad you got that book, because of all the books that have been written about us, that's the one that gets everything right. Wow. And it was my it was my Bible. And I said, you know, it always occurred to me that this book would make a terrific TV documentary series with clips and, and interviews. And, and, and they said, you know, we've been thinking the same thing. We just haven't been able to find anybody to do it. And I thought about it. And I thought, well, yeah, I'm the guy to do it. And I called John the next day. And I said, you know, I'm the guy to do it. And he thought for a minute. And he said, well, of course you are. Why did not I think of that? But yes, you absolutely are. So... And we tried to make it happen, and, and it did that. Yeah. But the one thing that John Cleese, uh, among other things, did for you, and um, is he got you one guest that yeah, he helped. He, he helped uh, make it possible for me to interview Peter Cook, uh, who at the time was uh, pretty much retired from the world of comedy, and at the time was a fairly serious drunk, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know the the. Th uh, I met him in a hotel room in L.A. He mm -hmm. was just kind of passing through town for one reason or another. And uh, spent a lovely couple of hours with Peter Cook. Well, the interesting thing about, uh, and, and we were talking about this earlier this week off the air, was that a lot of your interviews, because they were pre-recorded and not done live at the station, you had the chance to get, like, let's say, an hour of material and chop it down and get it into that half hour, or maybe for some of the interviews you had a longer slot. But, you know, right. went in there. For the most part, yeah. I was, uh, you know, my, my program for most of its life aired within a block of programming that was entertainment rather than information. Uh -huh. uh, so it was uh, most of the week during that time slot there were either radio dramas or uh, comedies, or it just it was it was a specifically entertainment block. So for me to do a solid half hour of just informational interview, even of someone very funny, I I, I didn't feel really right about doing that. I thought that, that that was sort of not really the the thrust of the show, and that the show had to have laughs in it. Even you know, yeah. hearing a, a brilliant comedian talk seriously about comedy isn't all that funny. It's very interesting, but it's not all that funny. Yeah. So, um, so most of these shows uh, have in them interspersed clips of these people's work as they as it comes up in the conversation, uh, and um, so that was the the the, the main uh, excuse for editing them. But once you, I, I love post production, and and I love making a silk purse out of a sow's ear and, and, and uh, you know, it's fun to tighten things up and make them better if you, if, if you have a deft hand with that and if you're able to do it invisibly. And and, uh, but, and uh, also I, I bring that up specifically because, as you said in, say, the Cleese Palin interview, the, you know, you just let him roll, but in the Peter Cook interview, it was very different, even though he wasn't drunk. Or, well, he was probably pleasantly sozzled. I don't even think he was. I, you know, he he nursed a, a champagne cocktail over a couple hours uh, uh, while we were while we were talking. Uh, he was just kind of old and 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 you know he spoke very slowly, but very uh, uh, he was still great. He was still funny, and he was still Peter Cook. And, and uh, just no, but, a, but you mentioned a that brilliant he, mind and, yeah. and and one of the funniest people who ever lived. Uh, 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 you know, a sad guy in a way. I mean, he said. Uh, one of the things he says to me in the interview, he said, I, I knew that I had done my best work by the time, well, when I was an undergraduate. 
and that I would never be that good again. Which was not necessarily true, quite honestly, for people who love Peter Cook and Dudley Moore. Or, uh, you know, I think it is true. Really? Hmm. I think it is true. Yeah, it was as an undergraduate that he wrote the Tarzan sketch, and 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 he wrote uh, you know a lot of the great sketches from Beyond the Fringe, and 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 some of the things that Kenneth Williams did that were so funny, and uh, he wrote a lot of the stuff that he later went on to do with Dudley Moore. Uh, you know, he wrote the Tarzan sketch. I asked him how long it took him to. You know the piece I'm talking about. Your listeners may not. Um, uh, it's but it's a it's a classic piece of comedy writing about uh, a one legged man <laughs> going to a casting agent auditioning for the role of Tarzan. I have, I have your your right leg is lovely. I have nothing against your right leg. Unfortunately, neither do you. <laughs> exactly. I'll never forget that line as long as I live. Yeah. It's trouble is neither of you though. If you're going to quote it, quote it correctly. Quote it correctly. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, but you're right. <laughs> at any rate, at any rate, I asked him how you know how long he works on that because if, if you really sit down and look at the script, every line is perfect. It's just a, a little polished gem of a, of a of a piece of comedy material. He said it took me as long as it would take you to type it. He said like, I had the idea, sat down at the typewriter, wrote it, and five minutes later I was on my way to dinner. You know, uh, and 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 that was. He was famous for that. He would just like get an idea and dash it off. And these are things that, that you know comedy writers look at and go, you know, oh my God, you must have polished that and edited it and honed it. And no, he just kind of typed it out. But uh, but those sort of things sort of stopped coming to him after a while. Uh, and uh, but but he he enjoyed his life. He oh, good. for the most part. Good. Had, I'm uh, glad to hear that. Had a, you... had a fun life and had a lot of friends and. Uh, uh, got involved in a magazine and, uh, slash newspaper, a satirical newspaper uh, called Private Eye. That uh-huh. was the, I believe he owned a majority share in Private Eye uh, in London. Uh, and Private Eye is, uh, especially during the years that he was there, almost exclusively uh, concerned with local politicians who are incomprehensible to foreigners. And so... I've seen a lot of copies of Private Eye that I just don't get. You know, there's, I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's a lot of funny there, but it's you know jokes about people I don't know. So. Let me ask. Um, uh, speaking of, well, just speaking of again, the people that Bob Claster has had on his radio program at KCRW, the one that really just made my eyes bug out because I almost, almost, if I tried a little harder, could have gotten uh, a, an interview for my own. Show or, or at least it may have been a little before Dave's Gone By started, so I would have done it just as a freelance writer more than anything else. But to interview Brother Theodore, uh, one of the great... Well, you certainly cult. could have interviewed Brother Theodore. I mean, he was in the damn phone book, you know, and waiting for you to call him. You right, know, but uh, he wasn't... A, you have to admit... That's true, of, yeah. that's true of most of the interviews that I did. Uh, these are people who had become somewhat forgotten... And we're eager to, to, to tell their story. Uh, you know, I did that same weekend. I was visiting my family in New York, uh-huh. and uh, uh, I, I had some connection with Brother Theodore in the past. I grew up loving that first record of his, and um, some friends and I had this student coffee house uh, in New Rochelle, and uh, we weren't paying anybody. And at one point, uh, I went down to see Brother Theodore perform in New York, where he performed every, I think, Saturday night at midnight, and uh, and he was great, and I asked him if he would come and play in our coffee house, and we couldn't pay him, but we'd love to have him, and he said, sure, I'd be happy to. Oh. Uh, uh, he said, the, my only problem is I want to make sure that there are no young children there who might be frightened, and uh, that was his only concern, and he came on a, you know... He took the train up to New Rochelle and did the show, and he was great. So I, I knew he was a lovely guy. And it just occurred to me uh, somebody should interview him. I was going to be in New York. And, and similarly, I called Quentin Crisp, who, who, uh, oh, yeah. whom I, I, I loved. And, and uh, so I did them back-to-back one night, you know, uh, on two successive nights. And uh, very interesting, two brilliant older men. Uh, With well, extraordinary gift for language, both of them, under the way the yeah. phraseology of both of those people was amazing. Yes, absolutely, and 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 that's something that I am drawn to. So that's uh, 
uh, I, I had a lot of fun with uh, with both of those, and they were they're both uh, certainly Chris more so than than Theodore, but they're both slightly marginal to the the world of comedy. But uh, at that point, my show had been on the air for a number of years, and I had a following, and I. Just my attitude was, I'll do what I want to do. <laughs> you know? Oh, and thank goodness you I, did. I was, I was in an enviable position at this station because the station was becoming hugely popular, and um, and yet the people who oversaw programming, none of them thought that I fit under their particular wing. So uh, we had a program. We had the, the program director slash station manager was a woman, a brilliant woman, but one with. Um, no sense of humor or affinity for comedy whatsoever and so she uh, totally ignored the program and the other person was the music director and he there was you know only occasional music in my show so he didn't think of, of me as under his department so people i was almost completely left alone isn't uh, that you know, the, the great conundrum of broadcasting you want everybody to hear and love your show and yet if you can operate under the radar that is also kind of cool too but I, I, but thank goodness you have the archives. Uh, well, you know, one of the nuts. frustrating things about about any sort of creative art, especially anything that's remotely commercial, is you know there are so many stories and so many instances of creative people who know best, who are not permitted to do what it is they're good at because somebody who has a job. Uh, that entitles them to tell the creative person what to do gets in and mucks it up uh, rather than just leaving them alone. I've always, the, the, I always, I love things like, for instance, this season on FX, uh, Louis C.K. had a show. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you saw it, no. but, and it may be still rerunning. If it is, you need to see it immediately and uh, rent it when it comes out on DVD or buy it or something. Uh, and what's wonderful about the show, first of all, I think that Louis C.K. is possibly the very best stand up currently working. Uh, I yeah. saw him live a couple weeks ago and just totally blew me away. He was just amazing. Uh, but he did this show for FX, and his deal with FX was. I'm not going to tell you in advance what the stories are. I'm not even going to give you titles. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go out and make these shows, and then I'm going to deliver them to you, and you have one and one choice to make, and that is do you put it on the air or do you not? Wow. So he's not getting notes from network suits. He's not getting interference. He's going out, and he's making the show that he wants to make, and he writes them all, he directs them all, and he edits them all. And I love that. I think that's your, your, now there, there are, there aren't a lot of guys who could do that. You know, there's not a lot of guys you should trust with that kind of responsibility. <laughs> no, it's, but the it's same lovely line. when it happens. Yeah. I've worked in television, uh, enough to know that the more money you get involved, the more people there are who have jobs where it's, in order to justify the huge amount of money these people are making, they feel they have to make some kind of input and make some kind of change, and they don't know what the hell they're talking about. And they just make stupid interferences that that that, uh, that ruin things. So it's always nice when somebody gets to just actually, yeah, I somebody mean, who knows what he's doing, does it. That's the, the the same principle as say that Larry David could create curb your enthusiasm, but he would be in a position to say, okay, you know, I've made gazillion dollars doing Seinfeld, and you, I've made you gazillions of dollars doing Seinfeld. Therefore, give me a camera, I'll do the scripts and the improv, I'll get it together, and I will deliver what I really want to deliver to you. I'm not pleasing sure. anybody but me. Um, and that is pretty great. Now, the downside advice. for Louis C.K. is that, you know, he's working for FX for, you know, $1.98 a show, and... Uh, you know, I'm, uh, he's. Hey, I, I'd work for a dollar ninety-seven. <laughs> well, he says he was offered a lot more money by HBO and by some other people, but they weren't prepared to give him the kind of autonomy that he wanted. Mm. And uh, and and that series of his was brilliant. It was just wonderful. Uh, uh, not for kids. Okay. I stress this. It's not. <laughs> it's it's maybe the most adult thing I've ever seen on television. Good lord. Uh, okay. And, I mean, are we talking about? Um, violence and sex, or are we just talking about stuff that's so beyond the realm of a child that, you know, how do you uh, mean? Certainly sex. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> not, not a lot of violence. Uh, 
uh, but but just very adult themes. And uh, uh, I have to check uh, this out. What, what is the name of the show? Louis L O U I S. L O U. I will. I will be checking it out. And I want to thank. Well, for, well uh, uh, but, but, um, the best, Bob. If, Bob. If, Bob. If well, yeah. Bob. If I'm not too. familiar with Louis. Mm-hmm. The best introduction to his comedy. What what he does that's so brilliant, and that I have so much respect for, is once a year he throws out his entire act. And and for a stand up, you know, pieces of material at work are like gold, and they you know they save yeah. them and <laughs> protect them. And and but he knows he does enough television, and the stuff gets burned up. And he he had a successful uh, HBO special. And he says, I think it was Chris Rock who gave him the advice. And he said, look, now you're going on a tour to promote this special. All these people saw this special and they loved it. Some of them even know it by heart. He said, if you go out there and you do that special, everybody's going to have a great time. They're all going to come out and see it and your career will be over. Because they will feel like they have seen you do what you do and it's done. They will not come back to see you a second time because they'll say, well, we saw him. So what you need to do is throw it all out and start all over again. You'll come out with totally new material. The people who love you will be pleasantly delighted, and they'll think that the new material is as good as the old material, and they'll come back next year to see what you got then. And that's what he does. He does. He throws out his material every year, and then he goes out on the road and does a tour of the country. By the end of the tour, he's ready to put that stuff on video, and he'll do either a special or a movie or something. And then he throws it all out and starts all over again every year. And each year's routine, each year's act yeah. has been progressively better and progressively deeper and more personal and and uh, more meaningful in addition to being funnier. I mean, he's just he's just hilarious. And so the his 2009 routine was filmed and is going to be released in. Uh, uh, like three or four weeks, January something. Well, well let, let me ask you, Bob. Bob, uh, first of all, I, I need to uh, do a station ID here. It's 12.02 in the afternoon here in uh, the University of Northern Colorado. It's also 12.02 a lot of other places in in this whole time zone. On December 18th, 2010, I want to welcome all our listeners to Dave's Gone By. We've been on since 10 o'clock and we'll be here till 1 or possibly a little longer because we're talking so much good stuff with Bob Claster and I do also want to play some more Captain Beefheart towards the end of the show to celebrate his life and uh, recall his passing yesterday. But we are talking with radio broadcaster and uh, TV person Bob Claster and he's, he's discussing, well, we got on to the topic of Louis C.K., which makes me ask, do you miss having the radio program where you would try and call up and try and, and, and interview people? Yeah, like I mean, that's about the only time I've missed doing it. Uh, by the end of it, I mean, most of the shows were just uh, um, playing comedy records or recorded comedy of some kind. I tried to, uh, again, keep the show in the entertainment rather than information slot, and so I tried not to do more than one interview per month. Uh, sometimes things just happened and, and people fell in my lap and I was able to do more, and I think there might have been a couple months that, that, that had more than one interview in them, but I tried to just do one interview per month. And but most of the time, there was this, uh, you know, by, uh, I had done everybody twice after about eight years at mm-hmm. least, and and I I got through about the first five years of the show without ever rerunning anything, except for I think some of the interview shows. But I never never reran a comedy show. Right. Uh, uh, and uh, and then I had to. I, I just I ran out of ideas. So see the problem is the the comedy record has, has as an art form had a very brief moment in the sun. And it existed for a very particular reason and served a very particular need that was no longer in existence after the mid-70s. So there aren't a lot of great comedy albums really post-Saturday Night Live. And, it's, and I think Saturday Night Live is, is the key reason why there aren't. Huh. Uh, uh, the comedy records were very necessary through the 50s and 60s because you had uh, you had a segment of the population that was underserved by mass media. You had a hip, educated 
uh, uh, segment of of the audience who were too hip for prime time. Who uh, you know the Carol Burnett show was about the hippest thing on television, right. and that wasn't all that hip. And you know television started out with hip comedy with uh, 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 Sid Caesar, but well, also Milton Berle, which was not so hip, but yeah. Pardon me? Well, and also Milton right. Berle, no, no. the anti But, 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 but yeah. there, there was hip comedy when television first started because the first people who had television sets were uh, educated and and uh, fairly wealthy and were first adopters and, and you know, cutting-edge people. Sure. As more and more of... And so so, so Sid Caesar could, could come on the air and do parodies of psychoanalysis in Japanese movies. But as more and more of the middle class and the lower classes got television, mm -hmm. the audience share for comedy like Caesar's uh, became too small to be worth competing for. And since Caesar was thrown off the air because uh, because of Lawrence Welk, who was on opposite him and was getting much better ratings. So once that shift happened, once television started courting the lowest common denominator because it became so huge, there wasn't much hip comedy on television. So you had hip people who, you know, who wanted to, to wanted something a little edgier than, than Andy of Mayberry. Right. And so, uh, you know, they, they sort of clutched to their bosom the Lenny Bruce records and the Bob Newhart records and the Nichols and May records and, yeah. and these things and they passed them around from friend to friend and people had parties and played this the, you know, yes. the latest Nichols and Nichols not to Nichols mention the party records, records of like, Red Fox can, can you believe people? they're talking to us you know yeah. this is this is smart stuff this is way smarter than what we're getting on television so you have this this, this underserved group of people who were getting their fix from, from these comedy records it was possible to do that at that point then uh, along, then Saturday Night Live came on in what seventy four, seventy five, something like that. Seventy five, yeah. And and right around that time in this country, we started seeing, even though it had already been in existence, we started seeing Monty Python, and um, uh, it, so so that that underserved group started to get served. Uh, I remember vividly the 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 sense. Of it was just this glorious feeling with Saturday Night Live came on. Oh my God, they're talking to me. Right. You know, uh, this is uh, they're actually, you know, they're putting on bands I like, and they're not lip syncing, and they're 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 doing drug jokes, and they're doing polit political jokes, and 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 you know, it was, and so that that pretty much signaled an end to the comedy record. You didn't need, you know, when when you had the, you know, stand up specials on twenty four hours a day on cable, and and and. Uh, you know, uh, well, it took a few years. It took a few years to die. I mean, uh, there was still the George Carlin stuff and the Richard Pryor. I mean, that went well into the early 80s. Uh, and Robin Williams was doing recorded material. I mean, it took, uh, for a while, it was a symbiotic feed. And then you had, of course, the growth of cable television, too. So Carlin could yeah. go on HBO and do his thing, and, and people would really be served there. So, so I, I think it wasn't until sort of the mid-80s that it really kind of tailed off. It wasn't like this immediate thing in the 70s, at least in, in my opinion. At any rate, there, there, there aren't a lot of new comedy records that I'd love to play on the radio, mm. um, that I wish I could play on the radio. I mean, look, Lewis puts out a, a, an album, and, and you know, uh, Maria Bamford has a very funny album that I just listened to a little mm. bit. I love her. And there are comics who are, who are putting out CDs, but... Well, we've got Dane Cook, it, and you've got... The the redneck Pardon guy. Me? You've got Dane Cook and the redneck fellow. Um, what's his name? Larry the cable guy. I mean, they, they they do. You know, but it's not the same. Yeah, I don't know that I'd, I'd give Larry the cable guy any more airtime than he already has. But you know, that's that's just me. Uh, but but at any rate, uh, uh, so no, I I don't miss uh, I don't miss doing that. Um, uh, I do miss the interviews. The interviews were fun, uh, and and I think I was really good at them. Uh, I, it, when when my favorite one of my favorite shows on television was Bob Costas's Later, hmm. the show that he did uh, after uh, Letterman on NBC for a number of years, in which it was just a one on one interview, and he asked all the right questions, and they had fabulous research coming up with incredible clips, and they got great people. And it was just this very relaxed, 
relaxed. But it was also, I happen to know from talking to people on the show, that was also a very edited show. Uh, it was edited so well that no one ever realized that. But Well, I wouldn't be surprised it, if it was also, huh? it's, I wouldn't be surprised if it's also the same with um, the fellow on public television who does the one-on-one interviews. Um, Charlie Rose? Charlie Rose. I'm, I'm, I'm sure he does, say, 40 minutes per person that is then chopped to about 26 I wouldn't be surprised. I don't, know. I don't know. I'd be interested to find out. I, I, I don't know. But I know that was, that was sort of what, what, what Costas used to do mm-hmm. is he would get someone like Shelley Fabre to come on. And she would want to talk about Major Dad, which was her current show. Yeah. And he would talk with her for half an hour about Major Dad. And he would say, as long as you're here, let's have some Donna Reed stories. Of course. Because that's what everybody wanted to hear. Right. So he'd get the Donna Reed stories, and that would be all he'd go on the air with. Ooh, and he would just throw out all the major dad stuff that nobody cared about. That's brave, because you, you don't get a guest back after that. But good for him, you know. But no, no, but but he did get them back because because they were great shows and people loved them. And 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 you know, I'm sure the publicists hated him, but I don't think the talent hated him. Hmm. But, the... but but I could be wrong about that. I now, don't know. Now speaking um, of of talents, you were using your talents. I mean, as you said, you were at. KCR working there, not just doing a show, but paying for other things. But your main bread and butter for a long while has not been radio at all. It's been television. So yeah, I was you know I I I, I was doing funny stuff and I was keeping my my oar in the water at KCRW, hoping that a real job would would pop up that I would be offered. And in fact, finally, a real job did pop up, and I was offered it, and it was. For less money than I could afford to live on, and uh, it was uh, understandably KCRW's license is held by Santa Monica College, and they, it's something that they do for neighborhood brownie points and no other reason. And they feel, rightfully so, I would imagine that, it, or at least at the time, this was their feeling. Things may have changed, um, but they felt, uh, why should we be paying these people who work for our radio station more than we're paying? the teachers who are doing the business of the university. So uh, we were getting paid a lot less than than most radio people get. We were getting paid teacher salaries and, and less. And, and so the job was at that time I, I had gotten married and I had two kids and I talked it over with my wife and realized I couldn't afford to take this job that I had been trying to get. And by that time, the bloom was off the rose. KCRW was changing and was becoming a station I didn't like as well. And I got to know the people well enough to know that I didn't think I would really fit in there uh, and be happy there as much as I had thought that I would. So, uh, uh, so I didn't take that job. And a friend of mine worked in television and was... Uh, got me a job as a researcher on a game show. She said, you ought to work in television. There's much more money there. And so I worked as a researcher on a game show. And then Which one? Which on... one? Which one? I was one of the worst jobs of my life. It was, <laughs> uh, it, it, was, uh, a re- it was the last remake of The Joker's Wild. Oh, my God. The Joker's Wild. With Jack, yeah. Jack Barry, right? No, this was after Jack Barry. I can't remember the host's name. I've blanked out a lot of this job <laughs> because it was so brutal and, right. and miserable. Why was it so a, awful? Because, see, pardon me? Why was it so awful? All right, well, the game was structured in such a way that the contestant was required to identify a noun. So you are told um, Valhalla. And the judge has written on the card in front of him, Valhalla, it's where the Norse gods went to die. And the contestant says, oh, yes, Valhalla, that's a town in upstate New York. And the judge says, no, according to my card here, it's where the Norse gods went to die. And the contestant goes, no, I went to that high school. It's a, it's a high school in a town in upstate New York. And you have to stop tape, and the researchers have to run and look and see, is it really a town in upstate New York, too? Well, I'm sure you get that on Jeopardy also. I mean, uh, that's a par for the course in a a trivia game, isn't it? Well, no, no, but but basically there were so many possible correct answers that could not be predicted. (laughs) So, for instance, uh, the coat of many colors 
and there were the, the judge has on his card, you know, it's from the Bible, it's Joseph, and blah blah blah. And the contestant says it's a Dolly Parton song, oh. and well, none of us, you know, and it turns out yes, it is a Dolly Parton song. But uh, you have to stop tape, and you have to call the Country Music Hall of Fame, or you have to call Dolly Parton's record company, or something. And these were this was pre-internet. Pre-internet, so we couldn't. Yeah, of course. Oh God. Today, that job of researcher would probably be a lot easier because you could just put the first ten Google hits up there, and and you'd be fine. But but we didn't. We spent a lot of time in libraries, and and it was brutal for a lot of reasons having to do with the personalities of the people that we worked for on a good day we got out of there at midnight on bad days we worked straight through the night into the next day wow and i was i was eventually fired from that job for a typo that i made at 5 30 in the morning on one such night so uh it was it, it was you know people don't read you don't realize you, you watch your tv shows you don't realize like there's somebody whose job it is to watch all those america's funniest home videos that come in like all day, every day. That's that's their whole job. Well, I imagine working. there's an army of people for that show. Uh, the amount of video that they would get. And it's those those things are just that's a horrible way to make a living. It's just it's just terrible. And and mm. besides which, there is this attitude in television that 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 I find so appalling, which is that people with jobs in television are just abused horrendously. Uh, and I'm not speaking from so much personal experience as much as just things I've I've witnessed. With the attitude being, look, uh, we're going to push you around all we want to because if, if if you won't take it, there's a line halfway around the block of people who will. So, and and you generally, they, you're being paid well, so therefore, you know, you're my you're my bitch. <laughs> but you're not being paid well for jobs like that. The people who are being paid well are the producers and the writers and the oh. you know the people who are protected by unions and the people who uh, own the show. Those are the ones who are making the real money. You who are watching these America's Funniest Home videos are getting paid crap. Because they don't have to pay you well, because once again, there's that line going halfway around the block of people who will take that job. Well, well, well what happened? What did you do after you got that third version of the Joker's Wild and, and got canned for your um, title? Yeah, I gradually segued into writing television. I wrote some um, specials for ABC on television trivia. Hmm. Uh, I wrote on a show for NBC called Memories Then and Now which was a really fun show to work on. I had a great time on that job. Uh, mm -hmm. That job actually gave me the best perk I have ever had in a job. That show actually flew me to Amsterdam to spend a weekend with Xaviera Hollander, the happy hooker. <laughs> and yeah. Now, well, she still... I, you know, there may be better perks on some jobs. <laughs> I don't know. That's a... Uh, that was uh, that was. Uh, All right, now hold on, hold on, hold on, Bob. Now she was she had written the book, so she was no longer a practicing uh, woman of the right. evening. So, but what right. did you do with Xaviera Hollander for a weekend, or dare I ask? Well, uh, well, Xaviera is a really fascinating lady. Uh, she uh, she's a great gal, great gal. Okay. She um. Uh, you make her sound like something out of Donna Reed. Yeah. Oh, yeah, spunky, spunky woman. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, she, she, she's a character. She, uh, uh, well, she went on for many years to write a column for Bob Guccione's penthouse. Okay. I, so should, I shouldn't admit to penthouse. knowing that, but I knew that. Yeah, okay. Pardon me? I should not admit to knowing that, but I knew that. Okay, so... Yeah, she had this column for decades. And, and the secret to that column that she told me was that after a couple of years, she, she would answer mail and, and answer questions. Right. And after a couple after a couple of years of actually reading the letters that people sent in and wrote, she was so appalled at how stupid they were that she asked that they not be sent to her, and she just made them up. Oh, okay. Well, that's and she said the real question. The real questions were too stupid. But what did she? What were you following her? In other words, she was a writer at that point. Well, my, my department on the show. The, 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 she, this was a show that aired, uh, it was called Memories Then and Now, and it was it was a show that was put together by uh, a company that probably no longer exists that was called NBC News Productions. Mm -hmm. And it was designed, because NBC has this huge archive of, of footage yeah. uh, from their history, NBC News does, and, and it's all lot in Fort Lee, New Jersey, in temperature-controlled vaults. And they thought, well, maybe we can uh, exploit some of this footage and do this sort of nostalgia show, a look back at certain things, at various different things, and we've got all this footage we don't have to pay for. Well, that's fine, except you can't do stories without using footage that you do have to pay for that NBC doesn't own. So uh, 
um, basically each show there would be a theme, uh, and and and, in, and in, within each show there was a department. Where are they now? Okay. If that was my three and a half minutes of television a week. Well, that does sound I like would, fun. Yeah, it was fun. And so you know, each week I would. Uh, you know, I would talk to Gary Lewis on the phone and do a piece about him, and then the next week it would be uh, uh, Bobby Sherman, and then the next week it would be um, uh, Sashin Littlefeather, you know, whatever <laughs> we came of. Yeah, right. Whatever we came of, and, 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 and where are they now? And so that was, that was my thing. So I did a piece of where are they now? I, I, I spent uh, an entire day on the phone with Pete Best uh, for that show. Where was he then? <laughs> Well, you talk There's to him. a great story. I don't know if he's still doing it, uh, but Pete Best, the man most famous for having lost a job uh, at the time that I spoke to him, was working for the unemployment department in Liverpool, helping other people find jobs. Well, that is nice. Which I thought, I thought there was just a real wonderful. There's poetry in that. Yeah, but when, you know, that's it. At this point, though, as wonderful as that is, and, and and bless him for doing that, wouldn't you figure he would be famous enough to do like a one man? lecture show he could tour around everywhere well he kind of is he's got oh. a band or at least he did back then he had a band and nobody really cared and well, yeah, well, you, know. you know i mean it's a it's a sad the feet best story is is certainly a sad one i mean it's sad in a lot of ways he uh um uh the the parts that, that i found terrible about that story are are the fact that uh the beatles go in the studio to record their first record love me do and George Martin is the fledgling young producer, and Martin says, just like offhand to Brian Epstein, you know, the drummer's not very good, but that's okay, I'll bring in a studio drummer, and uh, and it'll be fine. And the studio drummer's name was Andy White, oh, yeah. trivia fans, and, and so there is this version of Love Me Do, which, which came out and has a, a non beatle drummer on it. Right, well, I think that's even on the rarities uh, collection, yeah. Brian Epstein being very eager to please and and very happy to have his new EMI recording contract uh, says, I'll go you one better, I'll fire the drummer. And the boys don't like him all that much anyway. And uh, and it's true, Lennon and Harrison and McCartney uh, didn't really bond with Pete all that well. He, he was not really one of the gang and they didn't uh, share the unique Beatles sense of humor with him all that much, and, uh, you know, he was okay. They didn't think he was a terrible drummer, but they didn't think he was a great drummer. He basically was their drummer because his mother owned this club that they could play in. And uh, and he also so, was a good-looking fellow, so he, he was sort of one of the girl magnets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he was he was good-looking and had, had, had girls screaming for him. And and he, uh, um, so they, uh, they, they took him, uh, they took him on, but then, so, so, so Brian Epstein said, you know, I'll go you one better and I'll actually fire his ass. So Epstein went to talk to Pete Best and said, look, look Pete, thanks for the memories, but, you know, you're, you're toast. And, uh, but from that moment on, Pete never heard from any of the actual Beatles. Oh. Nobody called him and said, yeah, sorry, it's, you know, too bad, that's the way it goes. Uh, and when they became famous and, and wealthy, sh very shortly thereafter, uh, they they never sent him a little thank you note or tossed him a million or two here or there to just you know for the part that he played in helping them get off the ground. It's business. It's a fascinating. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I downloaded it illegally because uh, it's not available commercially, but you can download this fascinating document, which is the complete uh, Beatles uh, radio appearances on the BBC. And you get to hear them through 62 and 63 as they're getting ready to take over the world. Actually, I don't think and it's all that illegal. I, I think they did release a CD called The Beatles at the Beeb a few they years did, ago. And, might, and, and that doesn't print. do it. Yeah. That, I don't recommend that because that is, it, that's all, first of all, it's, 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 it's heavily edited and it's chopped up and it's, it's, not chronological. What I'm, what I'm talking about is if you listen to these things chronologically, uh -huh. from week to week, you hear them come together as a band. You hear Lennon wow. become a singer as opposed to just a guy with a good voice who's singing. You, you hear them gel, and, and it's a fascinating uh, progression. It's, 
you know, they, they were on the radio almost every week in, in England, and and in those days, you had to, um, uh, uh, pop music was not allowed to be broadcast on the BBC during most periods of the day. The BBC had different times of the day for different things, and pop music was only heard, say, Saturday afternoons for two hours. And so every kid in England was listening. <laughs> right. And so the Beatles' opportunity to be on the radio so much during those years was huge in, in, in helping them take over that country in preparation for taking over the world. And you hear them develop this poise and develop the, uh, I mean, as you listen to it <laughs> from week to week, and they will sometimes do the same song, you know, six weeks in a row. So you hear a lot of, I mean, the only song they let Ringo sing was Boys. So you hear Boys a lot mm-hmm. when you listen to these shows chronologically but uh and you hear from week to week harrison just struggling with the guitar part to please please me it takes him like about two months <laughs> to get the hang of it finally gets it by the end of it you know but but uh you, you can just hear them struggling with these things but you hear them coming together and again you hear the poise develop at first you know the the, the early ones in 62 you hear the announcers say well there's this band from from liverpool we kind of like them and we think of like, oh, please give a warm welcome to these, uh, what's the name here? Yeah, oh, the Beatles. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But by the end of it, it's like, oh my God, we are so honored to have the Beatles here and <laughs> for taking time out from their busy schedule because they're just like gods, you know? And, well, what's, what's, <laughs> what's but, funny for but, Americans, what's funny for Americans is that, you know, it, it sprang on, I mean, I, was, I wasn't even alive yet, really, but, but it, we didn't really get that sense of the build that they had in the UK for two or three years. Not to mention, obviously, in Germany, the Cavern Club and all that. But right. that sense of growing on the radio and all the kids knowing them and listening to them, for, for American eyes, it was just about, wow, suddenly they're walking off this plane and people are going crazy and they have a single out and they're on Ed Sullivan and that was it. We, didn't, we never right. got that but, ramping but, up. But they spent a lot of time getting ready for it. And, and, and if, you, if, if you can find this download, uh, uh, I hate to promote illegal downloads, but uh, uh, it's the Purple Chick is the person who put it together. That's a bootlegger who does uh, compilation things that are quite wonderful. And so just look for the Purple Chick, Complete Beatles, BBC stuff. And, it, you know, if you were to burn it to CD, it would be 20 or 30 CDs. I mean, it, it really is it's wow. many, many hours of shows. Uh, but but if you're as much of a Beatles fan as I am, you, uh, I found it just fascinating to 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 witness the the uh, the progression and to hear them get ready. And then you know by the end of '63, it's like, where are you going there? Go to America, huh? And they go, yeah, we're going to America. We don't know what we're going to find there, and, and you know what they're going to find <laughs> there. It's, it's thrilling. It's just thrilling because because you, you hear them getting ready and they think they're ready and they are ready, and it's just it's just so wonderful. Now, I unfortunately, you know, it's almost twelve thirty here um, at. Uh, University of Northern Colorado Radio, uncradio.com. You're listening to Dave's Gone By. At uh, Also, for more information about this program, davesgoneby.com. We're talking with Bob Claster, and unfortunately we have only a few couple of minutes left because I want to get back and play a little oh, more Captain Beefheart. You didn't mention BobClaster.com where you can hear oh. all these wonderful old radio shows. Right, Bob Claster, all those interviews, people like Stan Freeberg, Tom Lehrer, the Monty Python crew. And Van Dyke Parks, which is uh, not comedy, but... Uh, He's, uh, if you're a B Park fan, you may be a Van Dyke Parks fan. And well, Van Dyke was a, is, is an amazing man, and, and I had a chance to talk to him. He's still a friend of mine. He's a great guy. Oh, is he? Did he I always wonder if he, is he normal? <laughs> Does he give a normal interview, or is he sort of out there? Van Dyke Parks is one of the loveliest people in the world. He is. Uh, uh, he has a southern graciousness uh, about him. He's kind and thoughtful and 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 brilliant, and no, he's a he's he's a lovely, lovely, very special, uh, and very gifted man, uh, and brilliant and funny. Can funny, I ask funny. in your tra- travels and music? Because we really didn't have enough time to talk about all your television experiences, which is why early in the new year, I'm instantly and automatically inviting you back. To the neighborhood, if you would, you would yeah, gracious. Because all these Bob Claster fans are going to be clamoring <laughs> for more. A cluster of Clasterians. That's that's. Oh okay. you, know, you have not yet stumbled upon the one pun I like on my name, but well, uh, maybe uh, I'll just. Well, is, I mean, if I don't tell you, you'll try, and that'll be terrible. Well, wait, well, let's see. Well, first of all, this episode I think is a Claster piece. 
Is that the one? No. 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 Is it is it an F word that I can't use on here? No. No. Perfectly clean. Oh, perfectly clean. Okay. Uh, the name of this episode is uh, class, not Claster class, is it? No. It's like Master Claster. Master Claster. That's yeah. No, that's yeah, not it either, huh? Um, I always told my kids growing up, you should never make a joke on people's names because you're just hearing the name for the first time, but they've had it for their whole lives and they've heard every single joke you can imagine made about it. And no matter what joke you make on somebody's name, they're just going to groan when you say it. Well, okay. So, well, what, which one did I miss? good advice, I think. But uh, no, the one pun I liked on my name was Iconoclaster. Oh, that is good. Iconoclaster. That was the only one that, uh, that I liked. I like it. Because you're iconic for, for, for the interviews that you've done and, and for the work that you've done. And, again, next time we'll definitely get more into the whole television stuff. But I want to ask, in your travels in the music field, did you ever cross paths with Zappa or Beefheart, who are very much in our minds at this um, time? No. Uh, I, I did. Uh, there was a period of time where Zappa and the fledgling mothers performed in a tiny theater in New York on a weekly basis. It was like either every Friday night or every Saturday night. I think it... I don't even remember the name of the theater. It wasn't Max's Kansas City or anything like that, right? It wasn't Max's. Pardon me? It wasn't Max's, right? No. No, okay. no this was a theater. And it, it looks sort of like... You know, I mean, it's this really seedy, almost like a porn theater. I mean, it, it, as I recall the room... It was a very long and narrow room, so but it was it was definitely like a movie theater, and and so the stage might have only been about oh fifteen to twenty feet wide, and there were about thirty rows, each of which had maybe ten seats across. Wow! And and if it was that big at all, uh, and and Zappa they, Zappa and the mothers performed there every week for a while. And I had some friends who would go down and watch them. I think this was right, maybe like in between freak out and absolutely free. Wow. wow. Uh, and and so I, I went down to see them a number of times. Oh, you did go to I, see them? Wow. Okay. Yeah, I didn't. So, you know, I was a fan. I, I, I enjoyed them. Uh, I sort of lost interest uh, in Zappa at about the time of, I guess, maybe Burnt Weenie Sandwich or something like that. I kind of had enough, but, uh, uh... But in those early days with the mothers, you, I mean, you recognized that was there was something amazing going on. Yeah, and I loved the Ruben and the Jets album, and I loved Absolutely Free, and we're only in it for the money, and, and, and uh, uh, I think Lumpy Gravy started to get a little weird for me. Well, and, that sure. was the, and Uncle Meat, and all the, you know, the real strangeness began. But, yeah. But that is so good. Co- Do you have any particular memories? I mean, I know you, you said you went to see them a couple of... Uh, uh, okay. Or, or, or of Zappa, even, because Zappa would have been... Uh, I no, forgot I have, to mention I have, this. No, you got to realize, I mean, first of all, I was a teenager, and and, uh, and I saw a lot of great concerts. I mean, it was a fabulous time to be uh, uh, in high school in, sure. in New York. Uh, the Fillmore East top price was five fifty, and you never had problems getting tickets. So, you know, I saw, I saw The Who do Tommy the night it was released. I saw, uh, you know, the Allman Brothers with Dwayne Allman. I saw... Um, uh, uh, there was a double bill that didn't quite happen, but it was it was Cream and Moby Grape on the same bill. Didn't Moby quite Grape happen. didn't show up. Oh, but uh, uh, you know, I saw I saw virtually I saw I was at Woodstock. I was at the Bangladesh concert, uh, so I got to see a lot of music and stuff. So, um, did, uh, but memories of that, but no, uh, uh, no. Okay. Uh, and and I was I, I I hate to admit it, I was not a BFAR fan, and I was trying to think about that uh, while I was waiting for you to call, and I was listening to you, um, and 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 I realized that a lot of my musical taste and a lot of the I think the reason why there are certain artists that I don't much care for had less to do with the music itself as much as it had to do with the kind of people who liked them. Hmm. I was never a David Bowie fan because I didn't like your average David Bowie fan. <laughs> okay. And all the people who were going on and on about David Bowie were the sort of people I didn't care for. And I think the same is true for Beefheart. The people who were the crazy Beefheart fans were like really pretentious and sort of obnoxious and had this sort of superior attitude. Well, we we like this music. We're better than you are. Cause, you know, and, and I just, 
I, I, I didn't respond to them as people, and so I wasn't all that interested in listening to their hero. So, well, you know, uh, and they're, I think they're, that's true yeah. of a lot. I think that some of the musical biases that I have, I now have to reevaluate and realize that the music itself may very well have been valid, and that the only thing that that I didn't like was the personality of their fan base. Well, I, I was actually, I do believe, if I go back and listen to last week's show, I was talking about this in reference to uh, Led Zeppelin, where I was in high school and junior high school, and kids were just constantly playing it, and the kids were playing were the bullies. You know, and the greasers and, and like these people I was terribly afraid of who were who were often making my life miserable. And so, you know, let's oh, that's just loud, lousy rock music. I'd rather listen to folk, I'd rather listen to like intelligent lyrics and stuff like that and, and what the cool what, you people, don't you don't yeah. think uh, squeeze my lemon and let the juice run down my leg is an intelligent lyric? <laughs> and well when you're fourteen, you know, you don't even get it. Yeah. <laughs> And plus, that would have been yeah, a no, Robert I was Johnson a thing. Fan for, for a very similar reason. I, again, I, did, I, I remember the people who were the Led Zeppelin fans, and, and I didn't I didn't much like them. I still am not a Led Zeppelin fan. I think the music is just, you know, it's all bombast. And, and, and yeah, but some of it is, is it. tremendous. Some of it is, is, is great. I mean, it took me until my 20s, I guess. It's to... all hair, Dave. It's all about hair. <laughs> Led Zeppelin is all about Robert Plant's hair, and that's about all. Okay, well, he did have good hair at one point. You know, he's, at, at one, he probably still he still has the hair. That's why I envy him. Yes. It looks like a mop, yeah, but no, he still but, has it. You know. No, I was I was never a Led Zeppelin fan, but you know, I like a lot of blues music, and, and so did they, obviously. But right. You know. Anyway, we have been talking with Bob Claster, so I'm going to remind everybody again to go to bobclaster.com to find out more about him and to hear archives of all these interviews that he's done. I didn't even get to ask you about Steve Allen, I, I, the whole Stan Freeberg thing. We're going to do this early in the near, new year. We're going to bring you back. We're going to talk so much more about that, so much more about your years doing teleprompter stuff, all on TV game shows and the, the Jerry Lewis telethon. and I mean, just so much to your life. And we have... We haven't even scratched the surface. We've scratched oh, like an inch of air above the surface of the surface of, of Bob Claster. But it's, it's been delightful. It's been absolutely just so much fun to have a real conversation with someone who's been toiling in the broadcasting mines for all for all these years, Bob. I, I well, really, you're easily amused, Dave. <laughs> Well, I, I hope our listeners have been, too. And I, I would continue right to the top of the hour, both but I, I want to do more beef heart. Sorry? I said both of them. Both, yeah. Don't worry about it. I know, I know, I know. Anyway, uh, so what, what? last question for Bob. What project are you working on now? Is it musical stuff? Because I'll, I'll take out... I'll take well, out this thing. Right I'm, uh, 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 I still work in television uh, oh. every now and then. I, I, I teleprompted for P. Diddy on the uh, <laughs> on the Jimmy Kimmel show a couple nights ago. Okay. And it was very funny because I went from, from working with P. Diddy uh, to a little hotel where a friend of mine sings in a band that does 20s and 30s Depression era music. And so I went from, from P. Diddy hip hop to Depression era music and go little whiplash. Okay. Well, actually, Kanye West would appreciate that more than P. Diddy. Making that class. transition, but uh, yeah. no, I, st I still work at time. We're coming up on the award show season, and I'll work on a lot of the big award shows. I usually do, I usually do the prompting on the half hour that airs before the Oscars, the, the red carpet show that's hosted by Billy Bush or whoever. Uh, so I'm usually working on that show during the Oscars, but uh, do just about all the big award shows, uh, the SAG Awards and the the, the, the right. People's Choice and the uh, you know, all these big award shows. Uh, this year, uh, things have been a little sparse. Uh, I used to always have a regular running talk show, uh, which put bread on the table on a nice regular basis. Things like uh, I did Mind of Mencia and I did Spike Ferriston's show on Fox. And, uh, you know, I, I, I like having a regular show, especially a union one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it pays my benefits. But, um, uh, but I currently don't have one, so I'm not doing that. I, I would sometimes work on uh, Real Time with Bill Maher. Which oh, cool. Is a, which is a live show, and I, I like it because of that. Uh, and it's a smart show for smart people. And remind everybody, well, not remind, they, they don't know this, but the, the weirdest, coolest thing, and then we really do have to, to let you go, but one thing that they don't know about Real Time with Bill Maher is that, da, 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 you told me this earlier in the week, 
Where is it taped? Uh, it's taped at CBS. Well, yeah, oh, we know. Sure. Well, it, well, it's actually an I HBO know, show. I know what you're getting at. I'm yeah. just busting it up. Okay. No, uh, <laughs> the, the stage that, that, that Real Time with Bill Maher uh, is taped, uh, not taped, it's a live show. The show that it's broadcast from uh, on Fridays uh, is on Monday through Thursday, the site of The Price is Right. So they take all this Price is Right stuff, the flashing, the Vegas things. Do they push it to the side or they just cover it up, or what the hell do they do? Um, uh, they just move it somewhere. They stick it out in the hallway. I mean, you know, they're, 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 it's, it's a big building with a lot of uh, storage areas that uh, they, they get it out of the way. They get it out of our way so we don't see it. So that's, uh, that's all we care about. But it's just so amazing to think that, like, you know, all this Price is Right stuff is going on, and it, it's it, like this madness with the lights and the sound and the screaming and the everything, and then, boom, Friday night, there's Bill Maher. Um, doing it on the exact same stage, just kind of, kind of odd, kind of like that. Anywho, it's been absolutely delight, and I wanted to mention that Bob Claster was kind enough to send me another MP3 of his own music, and we're going to go out with that before we get to more B part. Okay, this is a more, uh, more thoughtful uh, song. Mm hmm. Tell, tell us, it's called "Thinking of You." Yeah, it's actually called Thinking of You and the Things That We Said. And the Things That We Said, right. another, And this is another old song. I did most of my songwriting, you know, in the 70s, and I've recently sort of rediscovered my old songs, and I've decided to make good recordings of the ones that deserve it, and this is one. Uh, I'm actually uh, assisted on this one by a spectacular young sax player named Max Kaplan. Max Kaplan on the saxophone, Bob Claster on the telephone. Max on sax. Um, I want to thank you, Bob, so much. I definitely will, you know, we'll be talking in January on this show, absolutely, because there's so much more to do. Thank you so much for being in the neighborhood. Let's hear Bob with Thinking of You and the Things That We Said.